So now we, I want to tell an interesting uh, story in relation to this, but I guess I'll just conclude this analogy first. That what is the tree of the what is the tree that the two birds are sitting on? Why is the example of birds given? Why why is it said two birds, not two squirrels? That would be more interesting, right? There were two squirrels, you know. But the the reason is that um, the 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 tree is representing our body, the body itself, right? And it's um, it's interesting because if you think of it this way, it's like um, it's like an ant almost. <laughs> you can move it; it's a moving tree. But the tree represents the body, and also the Gita uses the tree to represent the whole material manifestation. It says that the roots are the spiritual realm, and the tree that's upside down is this material universe. And that's why it's also given the example of a reflection in water. The tree is on the bank of the river, which represents the real reality, but material existence is like the reflection of the tree in the water. So it's upside down. And as long as you're lost in the reflection, uh, you're always searching, looking after for a mirage. You're always, as long as you're searching for happiness in the reflection of the tree, rather than going to the source, then you're never going to be satisfied like the, you know, the Rolling Stones. I can't get no satisfaction. Why? Because you're lost in the mirage-like existence. That's what we describe Maya, the Bahiranga Shakti, to be like the shadow of the real reality. So why live in the shadow? Why not go to the absolute reality itself? There you can be happy. So the birds represent the soul and the super soul which dwell within the tree of the body. Paramatma is described to be like a thumb-shaped Ishvar. He says thumb-shized. He said within the heart, the Ishvar, through meditation, the yogis can perceive him in the, uh, the size of like a few inches, basically. So Paramatma, that's in his uh, localized form as Paramatma. Brahman is his form as the entire cosmic creation, the fulgence of the absolute truth that empowers everything, the great spirit. Bhagavan is the supreme personality, but Paramatma is localized within every living entity. So if you're an ant, then he's present in the ant's heart in the size of a thumb as well. What's the size of an ant's thumb? But the idea is that according, he's within the heart of the jiva. And he's next to the soul. The soul is also very small. So actually he's bigger than the soul. The soul is described to be one ten thousandth of the tip of your hair. So if you take the tip of your follicle of hair and then you divide that into ten thousand parts, then that's the size of the soul. So that's why scientists cannot even, uh, they cannot see it with the microscope or with material tools. So the soul, that's one of the birds. And so it's described to be birds because you see birds reside in trees and birds eat the fruits of the trees. So what's interesting here is that one bird is eating the fruits. So what are the fruits? The fruits naturally are karma fal, the fruits of action. So when we act, action leads to different kinds of results. So those are fruits. So you have actions that are punya or pious actions, they lead to pious reactions or fruits, which lead to higher kinds of happiness. So if you do good activities, you're a good person in this world, you're philanthropic, good to your neighbors, basically follow the Ten Commandments as taught in you know, the Abrahamic religion or you know, in the Christianity, you're a good person, you're good to your neighbors, good to others. Then you develop punya. By punya, you can go up to swarga and enjoy in the heavenly regions for until your punya is exhausted, then you come back down to earth. So that's the result of eating the fruit of punya. Then the fruit of pop, or sinful action, or anything you do which is dishonest, or telling lies, or cheating others, any of that kind of action leads to pop. And as the jiva bird, when you're, you have, you're become, by performing your karmas, you become bound to eat the fruits of your karma, whether it's good or bad. So some of the fruits are sweet, some of the fruits are bitter. You eat the bitter fruit, you become disturbed. Bitter fruit means like, oh, okay, you do something, you do something very bad to another person, the reaction comes, an action leads to a reaction, as you sow, so shall you reap. So you hurt somebody else, you disturb somebody else, the reaction comes, you become disturbed, that's eating the fruit of pop. Eating the fruit of punya also leads to uh, dissatisfaction ultimately, because it's said in the Bhagavatam that if, even if you gain sovereignty of the whole world and you have all the wealth, all the women, all the, you know, you get the dream of, you know, like Scarface or whatever, you know. First you get the money, then you get the power, then you get the women, right? If you, if you get all of that, still you don't become satisfied because the Bhagavatam says that not all the objects of enjoyment in this world cannot satisfy the desires of a lusty man. You only want more and more and more, like Hiranyakashipu. Hiranyakashipu was not satisfied. He had, he had countless apsara goddesses that he could enjoy with. And yet he thought, no, I have to steal Sita. And that led to his destruction. So 
whether you get put in your pot, ultimately neither of them leads to complete satisfaction because it's still the soul alienated from its true nature. It's alienated from its true purpose. So it's not satisfied. So when we develop detachment and we learn to atato brahma jigyasa, now I'm going to remove myself from the objects of the senses and I'm going to reflect, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? And then you can come to the stage of, ultimately we want to come to the stage of niskam karma yoga. Niskam karma yoga means we still act. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, one who does not act, or who pretends not to act, that I am a sadhu, I am a sannyasi, I don't need to act, they are a mityachat, a cheater. He says a real sannyasi is not someone who doesn't perform any action or any yagya. He says they do everything, but they do everything for the sole pleasure of God. So that's why Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, yat karosi yad asnasi yad shohosi dadasi yad tapasyasi kunteya tat karusvam anarpanam. Whatever you do, do it for me, then you will not have to enjoy the reactions of your karma or suffer the reactions of your karma. That's why he tells Arjuna, no, you should fight. Do not give up your arms and go into the forest and become an renunciant. Instead, you should fight, but do it without being attached to results, without thinking that you're the doer. Prakriti kriya manani gunai karmani sarvasa ahankara vimudatma karta hamitimanyate. The person who is bewildered in, in, in ignorance, he thinks that I am the doer, while in reality, everything is going on by the actions of the three modes of nature. Goodness, passion, ignorance. So he said, also, do not even think, Krishna tells Arjuna, that you think you are killing another person. A person who thinks, I have slain another, he is in ignorance. And a person who thinks, I am being slain, that person is always also in ignorance. There, as Krishna says, in reality, there is no slain and there is no slayer. And that's a very high level of understanding, right? But as long as you're absorbed in the bodily consciousness that I am this body and you are harming another jiva, you're going to get a reaction for that as karma fall. You're taking, tasting the fruits of your karma. But if you become detached from tasting the fruits of your karma and you do everything as an offering of sacrifice, yagya, to the absolute truth to please him, then you become aligned in your pure, pure dharma and you don't experience any duality of material life. Then you, you turn towards the absolute truth himself Yet Kurosi Yet Asnasi, doing everything for him, you turn towards him, then you become free of all lamentation and you experience moksha, salvation. And then even after moksha, salvation, then you are existing in your true pure spiritual state. That's why the Mayavad, so-called moksha, is not actual moksha. Real moksha means transcending your material state and entering your spiritual state and your spiritual identity, not your spiritual void. So this is uh, the... The verses of the Svetas Vitar, and there are many other verses we'll go through that also show the fact that the soul and God are distinct. But we can remember and we'll revise these again. These are the ways to interpret a verse, the Upakram, the beginning, the Upasanghar, the end, uh, the Abhyas, what is repeated, the Apurvata, the novelty factor, what is the Falam, what is the conclusion, what is the Artavad, what is the author's own statement, what is the Upapati, what is the appropriateness or the conclusion. So we'll do one more quick video. Q. Sorry guys, I was kind of racing.